proclamation by His Excellency the Governor General of Australia. The Prime Minister, Mr. Whitlam, has been sacked. An affront to the Constitution of this country. John Kerr catapulted himself into national notoriety. In the words of the Master, the bastard has sacked us. November the 11th, 1975, Armistice Day, the anniversary of the day they hanged Ned Kelly and the day Governor-General Sir John Kerr sacked the Whitlam government. Well, may we say God save the Queen. <laughs> because nothing will save the Governor-General. Depending on your point of view, Kerr's action was either an act of political treachery or an act of deliverance from a shambolic, incompetent, even corrupt government. The dismissal was seen by those on the left as an act of collusion between the Queen and her representative in Australia, the Governor-General, Sir John Kerr. That speculation grew into a full-blown conspiracy theory over the decades. It's now been blown out of the water with the release of Sir John Kerr's personal correspondence with Buckingham Palace, those hundreds of documents were kept secret in the National Archives until now. These palace letters provide a fascinating insight into the relationship between the Governor-General, based at Government House in Canberra, and the Queen's official secretary, based at Buckingham Palace in London. So they provide a unique vantage point on the crisis and the dialogue that was happening back and forth in the lead up to the constitutional crisis in 1975 and we get to see the Governor-General's innermost thoughts about the crisis, about how he thought it might be resolved, his assessments of the personalities, Malcolm Fraser and Gough Whitlam, and he's writing to the palace and he's asking them for uh, advice and for suggestions and making comments, giving them his assessments, reporting back developments, and they are responding. There's a voluminous amount of letters and so they give us a very unique and new insight into the crisis from those two vantage points. It's time to create new opportunities for Australians. Time for a new vision of what we can achieve in this generation for our nation and for the region in which we live. It's time for a new government. Whitlam came to power in 1972 after decades of conservative government. He represented hope. He represented uh, 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 something that was young, even though he was in his 50s. He represented something different to what was, what was around. You know, the doddery old McMahon was pretty pathetic. Gorton had been hopeless. And, and suddenly he was this refreshing bloke uh, who was obviously brilliant, obviously uh, had an exceptional mind, and he excited everybody. The problem with Goff was he was a terrible manager of men. And so his cabinet never worked. It, it dissolved in a disarray. It wasn't a matter of factions. It was all individuals. No one liked anyone else. And Goff had no idea on how to corral them, how to get them together, how to get them working as a team. He didn't have a clue. The optimism surrounding Whitlam soon collapsed over incompetence, scandal and allegations of corruption. By 1975, the Whitlam government had held the reins of power for fewer than three years after sweeping in on the dynamic and groundbreaking It's Time campaign. It promised widespread social and economic reform. It also ended 23 years of being in the wilderness of opposition and Gough Whitlam couldn't wait to get started making good on his promises. For two weeks, Gough Whitlam and his deputy Lance Bernard ruled alone, running 27 ministries between the two of them. They did too much, too soon. This was a government by a tornado. I mean, this was a guy who was very strong, uh, very powerful, dominant, domineering, and he was determined to get his way and to change the face of this country, and he did it, but he wore out his party, he wore out the public service, and eventually he wore out public trust. Uh, so, he, he, so he paid a price for that in the end and of course we now know uh, that the Whitlam government by 1975 was beset by scandal, uh, ministerial resignations, uh, impropriety, uh, lots of things were going wrong for the government. They had lost a number of seats 
um, at an election in mid-1974. And so this was a government that was in crisis and on the ropes. The Rex Connor, Jim Cairns debacle of the billion dollar Kamlani loans affair. Cairns scandalous extramarital affair with Junie Morosi. I have no comment to make. Can you tell us anything about your political future, sir? No, I can't. Can you? Cairns misleading the parliament, being sacked but refusing to resign. And dissension in the cabinet sowed the seeds of the political crisis of 1975. The opposition, led by Malcolm Fraser, capitalised on the chaos and threatened to block supply, which the government needed to function. On November the 11th, 1975, Parliament ground to a halt. In the Senate, the opposition Liberals held a majority and blocked the appropriation bills, cutting off the government's money flow. There was no money. They were running out of money. The budget bills or the money supply bills hadn't been passed, basically. They were being held up in the upper house, the Senate, by Malcolm Fraser's team, that is the coalition. Whitlam secured a one o'clock meeting with Kerr and set off on the 10 minute drive to Yarralumla, confident that the Governor General would accept his plan to call a half Senate election. Unbeknownst to Whitlam, Malcolm Fraser had arrived earlier, his car hidden and sat expectantly in an antechamber. On arrival at Government House, the Governor General sat down with his Prime Minister. He immediately handed him a letter advising him his commission was being withdrawn under Section 64 of the Constitution. Stunned, Gough Whitlam stood and asked John Kerr if he'd been in touch with the palace, to which John Kerr replied, I don't have to. He left carrying a letter from the Governor General which he hadn't expected. He'd been sacked. It is with a great deal of regret that I have taken this step both in respect of yourself and your colleagues. I propose to send for the Leader of the Opposition and to commission him to form a new caretaker government until an election can be held. Margaret was in Sydney and Gough had a notebook beside him. And of course, Brian George had a good sense of humour, but he'd always ask in a very formal way, and how are you going, sir? He said, and Gough said, didn't look up, and he said, the bastard sacked me and kept on. I beg your pardon, sir? The bastard sacked me, I said. <laughs> The mood of the people was, was the only people outside were was absolute anger. I think in the dining rooms of the establishment they were celebrating um, because people, business people, were just on the bare bones of their backside. The economy was in disarray. But the anger was palpable. And there were thousands. Remember, there was no social media. You couldn't sort of text and say, have you heard this? But they'd obviously heard on the radio because it stopped the nation. The Prime Minister sacked and people thought, had no idea what it meant. So the people, and there were people who thought that Gough was the greatest gift ever to the Australian political scene. And indeed, to his credit, we're still talking about him today. Gough has risen above everybody else. There was nothing about Gough that wasn't big, including the mistakes that he made. But at the same time, he had this extraordinary and commanding presence, and he had a very, very devoted following. And these people mobilised. It was a day of shock and trauma, but there were two very different reactions, obviously. There was a sense of vindication, celebration and triumph on the Liberal side. This had been the greatest political and constitutional crisis in Australia's history, and the Liberals had prevailed. Kerr had intervened to make Malcolm Fraser Prime Minister. That was Fraser's strategy. That's what they wanted. The Labor side was filled with shock, dismay, anger. Anger was important and, and a profound sense that they'd been betrayed by the Governor-General. Sir John wished the man he'd just dismissed well. The polls are going well in your favour. I have held up my decision till the last possible moment you have campaigned well in the meantime, I think you could well win the election. The Governor-General was critical of Whitlam's public reaction. In a letter to the palace, Sir John singled out Whitlam's statement after the Vice-Regal Secretary, David Smith, read a proclamation at Parliament House. Mr Whitlam's reaction after leaving Yarralumla turned out to be, in fact, one of very great rage, which came through in many of his public utterances the earliest of which were made on the steps of Parliament House at the time when David Smith read the proclamation dissolving both houses. The proclamation finished with the words, God, God save, save the, the Queen. Queen. 
because nothing will save the Governor General. The proclamation which you have just heard read by the Governor General's official secretary was countersigned Malcolm Fraser. go down in Australian history from Remembrance Day 1975 as Kerr's Kerr. The reaction to the dismissal was shock and surprise. I was a party official and I remember I was just getting in the lift at 377 Sussex Street on the ninth floor when I heard the news of the dismissal and I, I don't think anything had ever shocked me uh, like that before. We knew there was turmoil in Canberra. There were all sorts of there was all sorts of talk about a special half Senate election. All sorts of things were were being tossed around. Nothing was being tossed around about the government being sacked, and it was an extraordinary moment uh, and one that I don't think anyone who was alive at the time can ever forget. And then, of course, it unleashed a tremendous amount of anger on the part of of Whitlam supporters and there was angst and there was anguish everywhere. We had riots all over the place. Um, things were, were, were hugely upset. And yet, when the time came, it showed that that was a minority being upset and Fraser just romped in at the election. Whitlam had offended so many and the Whitlam government was regarded as a financial failure. And so Labor went down. It waited a long time to get there. It didn't take long to get kicked out. I was lurking in King's Hall, it was just before Christian time, about 10 minutes to 2, the famous left-wing Labor Senator Georgie Georges came up to me and said, I've just been told that Kerr's sacked Whitlam. And Georgie Georges was not really a reliable source for political information, but as soon as he said that to me, I just felt this sense of urgency. I just felt straight away, this is probably true. It was an extraordinary day because even those people close to Malcolm Fraser didn't quite know what was going on. Throughout the 45 years since that November day, Republicans and anti-monarchists have asked, wondered and proclaimed that the order to sack Whitlam came from Buckingham Palace, urged on by the CIA. Britain, the Queen indicated her support for Kerr's actions, welcomed his advice, while maintaining the right of Gough Whitlam to govern as Prime Minister. But nowhere in the documents is there any sign of cooperation between the Queen or her private secretary and the Governor-General to dismiss the Whitlam government. In fact, this letter to the Queen's secretary confirms once and for all Sir John Kerr did not even inform Her Majesty before he acted. I decided to take the step I took without informing the palace in advance because under the constitution the responsibility is mine and I was of the opinion that it was better for Her Majesty not to know in advance though it is of course my duty to tell her immediately. Sir Martin thanked him for protecting the monarch. If I may say so with the greatest respect I believe that in not informing the Queen what you intended to do before doing it you acted not only with perfect constitutional propriety, but also with admirable consideration for Her Majesty's position. That exchange finally puts to rest the theory that an English Queen had connived in the dismissal of a democratically elected Australian government. The Republicans thought there was a great, some great conspiracy between the monarchy and Kerr, and that has been completely dismantled. So the poor Republicans are now attacking the Queen, and that doesn't do them any good at all. So. Whatever, whatever foothold they might have had in Australia, I think they've lost a significant part of it. Constitutional law expert Professor Anne Toomey says the correspondence shows there was no conspiracy. I can't see anything in there where the palace is giving any kind of green light to Kerr to dismiss the government. Kerr raises the fact that people in Australia are discussing the possibility that he might dismiss the government. He never asks or suggests that he will. 
Uh, and what you see in the response from the Queen's private secretary is things where they say, well, uh, you know, we don't want you to act um, precipitately. We want to make sure that uh, you obey the constitution and we hope that this never comes to pass and that the political issues don't come to a boil. Uh, if anything, they're discouraging Kerr from exercising the reserve powers. There's a critical passage in the judgment where Sir Martin Charteris says, although the reserve powers exist, the way they really function is by making sure that uh, people moderate their behaviour so that the powers don't actually have to be formally exercised. And he goes on to say that it would be uh, a very serious matter to actually ever exercise those reserve powers. It should only be done at the very end when there is no other option. So what we actually see is the Queen's private secretary uh, trying to discourage any a action by Kerr that might be taken prematurely. Uh, it's certainly not giving him a green light. It's impressing upon him the very seriousness of any such action and that it should not happen unless there is no other option. Even Republicans now can see that, based on the letters, the paranoia was misplaced. It's cleared through this process that John Kerr did make the decision himself and that that decision, though, was also informed by his correspondence with Buckingham Palace. The fallout from the dismissal was extreme. Highly respected political journalist with The Australian, Paul Kelly, was in Canberra on the day of the dismissal. When I listened to the critics saying that the Queen is implicit in Whitlam's dismissal, some people say, well, that's fake news. No, it's not fake news, but it is fake history. Kerr never asked the palace for permission to sack Whitlam. What he did was he gave the palace his thinking about the crisis. He was very honest in dealing with the palace and he discussed options all the time. One of the options was dismissal. What did the palace do in response to Kerr putting dismissal on the table? The palace said, be careful of the reserve powers. Only use them as a last resort. Only use them demonstrably if there's no other course available. No other course available. That's very clear. The palace is warning Kerr against dashing into any dismissal. The palace didn't want a dismissal. That's the truth. She certainly didn't prevent it. She certainly didn't write back to Kerr and say, you must not do this. Um, but she read the letters and basically left it to him uh, and said, it's your constitutional responsibility. You do what you think's right. Uh, and, and that's what Kerr did. I mean, sadly, uh, for Kerr, it meant he became an outcast in his own land and uh, he suffered a, uh, a pretty ignominious end. That, that having been said, I'm the only one in the Labor Party who'd say sadly for him. Most of them would say the bastard deserved every bit of the ignominy he finally achieved. People who were looking for some grand conspiracy where the Queen was conniving against Gough Whitlam uh, will be disappointed because there was no such thing. Uh, it was really the system worked as it was supposed to work, uh, where in the event of a deadlock, the reserve powers, these mysterious uncodified powers that exist in the monarchy and in the delegation of the monarch's powers to the governor general were invoked and those powers to this very day exist, have never been explained, and are written nowhere uh, and the Governor-General was able to use them as he pleased and get the outcome that he sought. So the system uh, worked as it was designed to work. It broke the deadlock. A lot of people were very unhappy with the result, which was the removal of a democratically elected uh, Prime Minister and the instalment of the opposition leader as caretaker. Uh, but that's how the system was supposed to operate. Ultimately, the Queen and the Palace took the view that this was none of their business and they shouldn't intervene. And the reality is they shouldn't. You know, ultimately these sorts of matters under the constitution are powers for the governor general to exercise, not the queen. And they should be exercised in Australia by Australians. They were exercised in Australia by Australians. Uh, and um, I think that's really the take out of all of this. You know, we shouldn't be blaming 
um, the CIA or the Queen or anyone else. It was an Australian problem. It was dealt with in Australia. If you don't like the outcome, by all means, criticise it. But as Australians, we have to take responsibility for it. The letters also reveal a lot about the state of mind of the Governor-General. Throughout his time in the role, Sir John Kerr exchanged regular and warm correspondence with the Queen's private secretary, Sir Martin Charteris, detailing the courage crisis and the problems that he faced. On the subject of the blocking of supply, which led to Whitlam's dismissal, Sir John wrote... One point is that it neither can get supply and public servants, etc., and not being paid, it is said that only an election can resolve the point. And if Mr Whitlam will not advise one, I may have to find someone who will. My mind is at the moment open on this. In a letter to the palace a month before the dismissal, Sir John expressed a concern that Whitlam might sack him first. He received a reply that the Queen would take, quote, most unkindly, quote, to that. But Sir John got this ominous qualification. I should make the point that at the end of the road, the Queen, as a constitutional sovereign, would have no option but to follow the advice of her Prime Minister. The dismissal sparked angry demonstrations all over the country and the Governor-General was frequently the target. Sir John told Buckingham Palace this meant new security measures. For the time being, my wife and I are resting after the burdens of the crisis. We are not doing this willingly, but under security advice. The security people are not anxious for me to leave Yerolamla. I do not think violence is feared so much as demonstrations or indignities, which would not be good for the vice-regal office or the monarchy. Personally, I do not think there would be very much, if any, of this, but I am taking their advice until the campaign opens and the two policy speeches are delivered. On another occasion, when Sir John complained about the stresses of the job, he received support from Sir Martin. As I have had occasion to remind you on previous occasions, the Governor-General of Australia does not seem to lie on a bed of roses, and it is clear that you may be faced with some difficult constitutional decisions. So could it happen again? The Constitution is still the same, and political debate has, if anything, become more robust. The dismissal won't happen again. There's universal agreement, I believe, from every subsequent Governor-General following Sir John Kerr that he did the wrong thing. I've got no doubt that no Governor-General following Kerr would have done that. Sir John Kerr had power under the Constitution, as all Governors-General do, to appoint the Prime Minister and also to remove the Prime Minister. And that's known as a reserve power, which means it's a power that is exercisable without or even contrary to the advice of a Prime Minister. Understandably, no Prime Minister is going to advise for themselves to be dismissed. Uh, yes, it's a valid power. Yes, it's happened in other countries. It's not just something that's happened in Australia. Uh, and certainly, Sir John had the power to do what he did. The real question is, was it appropriate that it be exercised at that time? And that's where the real debate was. Should he have waited? Was he really at the end? Were there no other options? This could all happen again. It could happen again next year or in five years or in ten years unless we make some change to the system. It can, it, the only thing that's happened is that both Labor and Liberal have committed to the convention that they won't use the Senate to try to block supply to an elected government. Now, that's just a convention. It's not a law, it's not a rule. But there are calls for change to ensure it won't happen again. I'd like to see reform. I mean, I'd like to see the Senate's power over supply removed. I mean, that would be very desirable reform as far as I'm concerned. That requires a change to the Constitution. The parties are divided over it. It won't happen. For 42 years, these 1,200 pages, over 200 documents sent to Buckingham Palace through diplomatic bag lay undisturbed. That was until a 10-year campaign by historian and author Jenny Hocking to have them released. There's a huge sense of relief and uh, uh, great delight, I must say, in being able to read these letters for the first time. Um, it, it, it's something I felt very strongly about as a critical part of our history and that we all had a right to know that history. It was always going to be one of the most important, if not the most important, holdings of archival material about the dismissal that we were ever likely to see. So the fact that we can now see it, 45 years after the letters were written, is, is really a wonderful moment for our history. Their release gives greater insight into the political 
and vice-regal relationship between Australia and Great Britain. It also puts to bed the royal conspiracy theory, but as people pour over these pages in the years to come, undoubtedly there will be new theories. Whatever happens next, this gives us the greatest insight into what's one of the most remarkable periods in Australian political history. Thank you.